Hey, what's up guys? It's Reed Young, aka Shuda here. I'm going to bring you the fourth and final part of this Heads Up series that I've been doing for you guys. Um, you know, just a little free gameplay to give you guys a little taste of some Heads Up action, get into some marginal spots that are fun to discuss. I'm out here in Cherokee, North Carolina, which is basically in the middle of nowhere for a World Series of Poker Circuit event, or rather several events. Uh, the main event's coming up this weekend, so if you guys want to say what's up, definitely come by. I will be here grinding. Um, just ahead of time, if there's any noise or anything, it's probably one of my drunken friends fumbling around our uh, cabin that we have rented here. So, a 3-bet 9s. Um, actually, just a little bit of heads up uh, for our opponent here. If you guys haven't seen the other three parts of this video, which I would recommend you do, um, if you do want some more detailed reads. But just a, a quick recap is this opponent's been generally passive preflop. Um, we're not really getting 3-bet for value. I don't see him 3-betting many hands like uh, King-10. I think even one time he didn't 3-bet Ace-King, which generally is uh, a pretty big mistake preflop and heads-up play. So... Um, you know, definitely some things to take advantage of there. I think most of his bets represent very polarized ranges and probably has it a lot of the time. So he's just kind of giving up unless he has a piece of the board. So it's pretty easy to win some small to medium pots and uh, kind of just wait around and hopefully be on the right side of a cooler if a big pot does get played. So that's what happened. Um, I actually had a flush with 8-3 suited, I believe, and he had top pair with the nut flush draw. We got it in on the flop and I won, so that was our, our significant pot. Um, otherwise, I've just been winning a lot of small and medium hands, which is kind of the way it's going to go against a, a loose passive player heads up. You just take down a lot of small pots, and occasionally, you know, both people have top pair better and the money gets in. So. Uh, feeling pretty comfortable against this guy so far, and not really much to worry about, not much trouble had. So I go ahead and 3-bat with 9s. I think it's probably slightly better against this opponent than calling, um, just because if I 3-bet and he calls, I would expect him to have a much stronger range than a normal heads-up opponent, so I'm not really getting much value pre-flop. Also, I don't think he's 4-bet bluffing ever, so... If I do 3-bet 9s and get 4-bet, I might have to fold, which would be a horrible, horrible feeling. And I'd probably be making, you know, some fundamental theorem of poker mistakes here and there, even though, you know, his range would certainly warrant a fold, um, given our history. I mean, there's basically... I, I don't think I've ever even said that before, that 3-betting 9s preflop and then folding them to a 4-bet heads up would ever be a good idea. But that's because, um, you know, this is a pretty unique type of opponent that we've been playing so far. So I don't want you guys to think that 3-betting and folding 9s would be a good play against uh, really anyone besides someone who habitually calls with weaker hands and then only re-raises with great hands. So it's pretty easy to play against, and you can get, you know, some value preflop. And it's a little bit better than just flatting, I think. Because if you flat, you know, nines, you can see a lot of over cards. So a continuation about the flop, actually, um, let's talk about that a bit. I don't really have any threes or twos in my range, uh, nor does he, I would imagine, given our history. Like I said, he's just folding a lot pre-flop to my re-raises. Um, for that reason, you know, you could also make the argument that three-betting with nines is a good idea, just because I'm trying to three-bet a decent amount. I'm trying to re-raise his opens a decent amount, because he doesn't... Uh, call my re-raise or forbet my re-raise nearly often enough to put me into any trouble. So I can balance out all my bluffs with some thinner value bets like 3-betting uh, 9's preflop. So 3-bet, I uh, flop top set, I decided to bet because there are a lot more times I would rather bluff this board than value bet it. And because of that, I do need to value bet it when I do hit major hands like this. Uh, checking could be a good play, but I think it's one that, you know, doesn't really help your game plan out as much as does betting. Because it's easy to slow play a hand here, but that relies on a bunch of different things, and I think 
kind of uh, a different opponent than the one we're facing. I don't really expect him to um, to three barrel a hand like queen jack of spades on this flop if I check. So uh, maybe it would give him this turn, but I don't think a lot of a lot of players like my opponent are just going to go crazy if I check the flop. So I think I do better by betting and getting some value from sixes or draws or maybe ace highs and a few over card type hands. So I bet. Um, on the turn, it's definitely one I would like to bluff and semi-bluff quite a bit. So all my draws, like 7-8 or queen-jack, king-jack, I might be barreling on the turn and hopefully trying to get him to fold a hand like pocket sixes or ace high where he thinks um, okay well now I'm either racing or way behind so I'm kind of in trouble facing a, a bigger bet on the turn and likely a, a river shove which I think is key um, if you make a bluff on the turn you need to follow it up with a shove fairly often to be uh, threatening on the turn and a lot of people don't understand um, that application of excuse me that application of reverse implied odds so I think uh, three barreling is going to be a pretty likely outcome of the hand once I do bet the turn. Oh, all right. So on the river, it's a queen of diamonds, <clears throat> which gives him a flush, I think, a lot of the time because he is um, drawing pretty passively here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some, uh, some bourbon went down the wrong pipe there. So, he, he is drawing uh, pretty passively here, and I don't think he's going to have many one-pair hands to now call me on the river. Uh, he may even fold hands like, you know, 9-8 suited. Uh, basically, all the 9s are accounted for anyway. So, his range is pretty draw-heavy on the turn, and I think worse draws, like straight draws, might even shove quite a bit. So, it's very difficult for me to get value on this river. I don't think I need to have a very wide value range, but because this is basically the scariest river in the deck, I do need to value bet pretty thinly since I would be bluffing here, um, you know, a lot of the time had I bet the turn with a bluff with something that doesn't have showdown value on the river. Like, uh, you know, ace four of hearts maybe, or seven eight. Um, he calls with king jack of hearts. Actually, I'm going to back it up just so you guys can see the board and everything while I um, kind of talk about that a bit. If I can find the right spot in the video. Let's see. Okay, well, never mind. Uh, so king jack, on the flop, it's two over cards and a backdoor flush draw with a backdoor straight draw. If you think about it, there's a ton of turns that he can continue on. So it might look like a fishy play at first, um, having gotten to the river with that hand, and then, you know, oh, he got lucky to hit the straight. But I think it's part of a pretty well-designed game plan on his part. Because, like I said, when we were talking about continuation betting the flop, I think he misses the flop quite a bit, and I do too. So in order for him to be less exploitable by my continuation betting range, uh, so I can't just bluff 100% of the time, he needs to be calling with some hands like that. So you can hit a king, jack, queen, ten, or a heart on the turn and be uh, be pretty happy with, you know, continuing, uh, maybe shoving some of the time as a semi-bluff and maybe calling with made hands and letting me continue to bluff or value better or worse hand. So uh, I think his play is completely fine. On this flop, I think continuation betting is fine, especially against this opponent, where I don't be or I don't expect to get check raised a lot, and we're very deep as well. Not very, but 150 big lines deep is pretty deep. Uh, I don't expect him to check raise something like Ace 10 here, even um, this deep, and he's been pretty passive anyway. I think this would have been a great spot for me to three bet as a bluff, um, especially because he just won a stack. Um, I don't think he's, and, and it was a stack that used to be his, which is important. I don't think he is going to be like trying to shove 5-4 over a 3-bet here. So if I make it, um, 
you know, 18 or something like that. I think I do take it down often enough. 18 is a bit larger, but I think it really helps uh, sell the, the sizing and it sets up the turn for a shove a little bit better than a smaller sizing would. Um, it's something to keep in mind when you're sizing a 3-bet bluff or value bet on the flop is how the rest of the hand's going to play out. So you don't want to make it massive and risk too much when you're bluffing the flop, but at the same time you don't want to um, you don't want to just like min re-raise and, and then make the uh, the turn in river awkward either because you get flatted a lot then and it's very difficult to decide what to do against a potentially wide range. Looks like I'm making a note off screen. Not really sure what that is. Maybe it's something having to do with the checkers. Oh, okay, it looks like I picked up a little timing tell, possibly. I think that's that's pretty important to keep an eye out for. Especially heads up. A lot of the time, people aren't just going to be like 10 tabling 6 max or full ring and then also playing a heads up table. So in general, timing tells are going to be a bit more reliable than they would be uh, at a 6 max or a full ring table, I think, heads up. So I'll uh, take that for what it's worth. You guys can see I've been re-raising a lot of my hands now. Um, really what I'm trying to do is just get him out of his comfort zone now that he's won a bigger stack from us. I think he's going to be a bit more careful with it. Like I said, um, when you check raise the 10 7 6, uh, I guess the thought process behind not 3-betting had something to do, I remember thinking at the time. Um, since he just won a hand, he might think I'm tilting or something like that, but I don't really expect this player to widen his check-raising range based on that thought process, because he would have to check-raise thinking that I'm 3-bet bluffing the flop often enough for him to shove a very wide range, uh, and I just don't think that's the way he's been playing. Uh, maybe he's preoccupied, or maybe he's just uh, passive in general. But I don't think there's there's much to uh, much to it other than that. Um, on the flop, I continuation bet. Sometimes I could go for a delayed continuation bet, or try to just check down king high, since it'll be the best hand a lot of the time. I think it's less often against this player, and I do want to keep up my aggression on this turn. I decided to bet again, and it's because he's going to have a lot of hands like 10-7 uh, suited, or jack-7 suited, some marginal connecting hands like that, and not an ace. And also another uh, important point is that my range is a lot more uncapped than his on this board. So I can have ace-jack, uh, you know, pocket tens, pocket jacks, aces, king-queen, whereas all of those hands are extremely unlikely for him to have. So for him to check call three times here, he is going to be check calling the river with a bluff catcher the best amount of the time. So that's important if you're in the big blind shoes as well, because you need to, you need to be check calling some strong hands instead of just check raising them, anticipating being barreled by aggressive opponents who realize that your range is on the whole fairly weak. Um, and then again, uh, he just hasn't been showing a propensity to, you know, call down lightly um, or from multiple streets. So I think even on the river, a lot of the time I could get him to fold a weak ace, which, you know, is is pretty easy to exploit just by three barreling every time. And even, um, you know, my blocker, my king blocker blocks uh, some of his straight draws. And it also gives me some equity. So I think a, a king, a bear king, or a bear queen are decent enough hands to three barrel there against this opponent. Um, and then you guys can see I've been raising 100% of the time to 3x. Normally I would probably min raise if I were to be raising 100%. But because this player is so loose passive, he's been calling out a position a lot of the time. So it allows me to... Um, to get a lot of flats pre-flop, and then a lot of continuation bets on the flop and turn, like the last hand where I had uh, the king on the ace-jack-10 board, and went a little bit larger of a pot on average. So because I'm not getting check-raised or um, you know check-called lightly enough, 
I think my best shot at exploiting him is just by taking down larger than average pots. So uh, here's an interesting spot. Against this player, I think it's a bet, and even still, it's fairly close. The reason I bet is because there are very few great turns for my hand, so I'd rather treat this kind of like a semi-bluffing hand uh, against this opponent. If I check back in the turns at Jack and he bets into me and I decide to call one street, it's going to be very difficult for me to know how to react on the river. And it's going to be very easy for him to figure out what I have. So in all likelihood, I don't have uh, Jack 4 or something like that compared to the amount of times I would have something like 5-3 suited or a similar hand. So I think by betting the flop, I can avoid those situations and... The most important part about that is that he has not been check raising me with any regularity. So I think it'll just be much easier for me just to bet and try to take it down. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, here's where it ends. If you did, please click that like button and share this with a poker buddy. If you have one, that will help the, uh, the channel grow and I would certainly appreciate it. But until next time, I will see you guys in the comment section if you have any questions about the gameplay. And take care.